So now let's move on to the next session. Uh, the chair will be Dr. Manon Cox. Uh, she is currently an ISV uh, board member and also ISV fellow. We all know she has a great successful career uh, bring a novel vaccine product to the market at the protein science. That experience probably is valuable to us now develop a completely new technology vaccine. So uh, Manon, welcome to be the chair. Thank you uh, for this very nice introduction. I want to thank um, the organizers for putting together an excellent program. And during this session, we will learn, we will hear from Gregory, Gregory Glenn about the progress of their recombinant SARS uh, protein, SARS or spike protein. And we will hear a progress from China on an inactivated vaccine. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Gregory Glenn. He is the president. Um, and he leads uh, research and development and the discovery of clinical and regulatory teams at Novavax. And he will update us on the progress Novavax has made on their um, recombinant spike protein vaccine. Gregory, up to you. Good morning. Thank you, Manon. Nice to see you. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to present this morning. It's been an excellent morning. and. Uh, I would want to say it's been great. The FDA has provided really, I think, very constructive guidance for uh, companies to uh, d do this. And I, I just, you know, I commend their work. Uh, so thank you for that. That was a very interesting morning this morning. So uh, if you go to the next slide, so I'm just going to give a brief introduction. Not everybody knows Novavax. And so if you go to slide two, uh, just very briefly, we are a late stage biotechnology company. Uh, we are developing innovative vaccines. We're focused on viral respiratory uh, vaccines, especially. And what we bring to the table is a recombinant antigen manufacturing platform. And, and I think, so I'll go through the uh, specific example here of COVID. We do have, uh, I, I think, a very um, good uh, improvement over the, the sort of basic recombinant technology in that we make a nanoparticle. And I'll talk a little bit about how that is done, but that makes uh, extremely good immunogen. We also have Matrix M. It's an adjuvant. It's a saponin adjuvant, which that class of adjuvants have been around for some time. <clears throat> and again, there's a. I think we've made a, an improvement by making a particle, and this has got uh, a fairly extensive clinical experience. And uh, these are two. I think they uh, very good marriage between a, a extremely well-folded, prominent, uh, and uh, immunogenic antigen and matrix M is uh, an adjuvant that has a good safety profile. So actually, if you go to the next slide, I'll talk about our programs just to give you a sense of, of where we're at. So if we could look at the second bar there, the nano flu, uh, we, and it's not well known uh, because the news around this phase three trial uh, was buried in the uh, onset of COVID. I don't know if, yeah, there we go. Thank you. Uh, but we unblinded a phase three uh, non-inferiority trial with our uh, nanoparticle influenza vaccine in older adults. And we met eight, all eight co-primary endpoints. All the secondary endpoints were st statistically significant. We really, it was, it was really a, a perfect trial data set. Uh, so that was in March of this past year. And that had followed serial trials where we are comparing the nanoparticle seasonal influenza quadrivalent vaccine against licensed comparators. So it's very good data. Uh, and I think it you know, indicates a few things. The company is a, has, has mature technology. Obviously, we're not licensed. Uh, but we've worked with multiple uh, programs in phase three. So we have an experienced team internally, a great technology. And uh, you can see there we have an RCF vaccine uh, in, uh, for uh, infants, which we uh, expect to resume that development. And, uh, and then you can see at the top, we're working on the, the coronavirus. We have had experience with other emerging diseases such as uh, H7N9, H5N1. Uh, the nanoparticle technology uh, trials are represented here, and that includes Ebola, which was a very good exercise for us in terms of, of making a construct, scaling up uh, clinical testing, and it was um, extremely important for us in terms of helping us roadmap what to do today. So let's go to the next slide. We're very focused now on COVID, our COVID vaccine. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to do now is talk to you a little bit about our construct, and I hope it will 
uh, show you why this approach is so promising. So we are making a full length uh, spike prote protein. It's uh, in truly full length. If you can look in the far right, you can see we have a transmembrane domain. Uh, and so most constructs are, are, um, are truncated and stabilized with some form that allows it to form a kind of trimer. We think the full length protein is very important because these are flexible mobile proteins uh, when you fix, uh, and that's there's some risk even with uh, point mutations. Uh, when you fix these, these spike proteins, that's not how they are in nature, you lose epitopes. Uh, we have some really good data on that in our previous programs. But we found, we actually, when the virus was first identified, uh, we made about 30 constructs. Uh, we evaluated for their stability, for their immunogenicity, uh, for their productivity in the expression system. You can see here, we made two mutations that uh, a furin cleavage site mutation and a 2P mutation in the uh, heptad repeat region, uh, which allows this protein to be quite stable, but remains flexible. So we make a trimer, you can see there, uh, we've looked at this trimer, others have looked at this trimer for us, and it's at the atomistic level, we know it's in a, a prefusion form, uh, and it's a trimer. And if you see on the right there, these trimers are then going, that are uh, made during the manufacturing process, are put into a nanoparticle. And I can't go into too much detail here because I don't have time, but essentially, you know, it's an insect cell uh, uh, protein, uh, uh, baclovirus insect cell expression system. The full length protein is made. It's put into a lipid raft in the membrane of the insect cell during the uh, purification process. We elute it into a detergent micelle and you get this beautiful, uh, you know, very stable, uh, detergent protein micelle and allows a lot of mobility of the protein. Uh, we have a flexible, as you, as, as I mentioned earlier, the full length trimer, and I think this makes an extremely good immunogen that, that reflects the native form of the spike protein um, and presents it uh, obviously without the uh, presence of other antigens. We also, the partner I would say of immunogenicity is the matrix M, as I mentioned, we have two fractions of the Qualia saponaria uh, saponin extraction uh, put into lipids. Uh, you can see they form these little nanoparticles, approximately 30 to 40 nanometers. So both of these, from a standpoint of the immune system, they look like danger signals, they look like viruses, and they provoke a very robust immune response, as you'll see in a minute. So if you go to the next slide, you know, in terms of trying to characterize the, the spike protein, we have uh, some very, I think, elegant information that has general relevance and then relevance to our vaccine. So what you're seeing here on the left, in octet, we take the ACE2 human ACE2 receptor, uh, we put it on a chip, we flow our spike protein vaccine across and it binds. And you can see the, uh, the upstroke is the uh, on rate and the off stroke is the off rate. And this, uh, is a, this represents a very, very high affinity interaction. In fact, we can't really measure it because these are, uh, the off rates are essentially straight lines. So this, this spike protein ACE2 interaction is a very high affinity event. I think it reflects what happens in nature. It's one of the reasons that would suggest that the virus is so very infectious that you know, a binding event of the spike protein to the ACE receptor uh, uh, you know, if, there's, if they're in proximity, it's going to be successful. It also suggests that our protein is in native configuration, and we have a second orthogonal method on the right by ELISA, and this is convenient because it allows us to look at the potency of our vaccine uh, using a, a, you know, critical functional activity, the, the interaction between the receptor binding domain and the ACE2 receptor. Now, if you go to the next slide, as I mentioned, we, did, we made about 30 constructs from the receptor binding domain only to different uh, uh, permutations of the protein. And you see two here, two candidates, the one on the left uh, with the very fancy name of NVX CoV-2373, um, and that's the one we selected. And then the one on the right was another uh, you know, uh, permutation of our, of, our, uh, of our process. But on the left, what you can see is we took this, this uh, protein, this is a now a potency assay. You can see we're measuring the nanogram for ML uh, binding to ACE2. So it's very potent. And you can see we tried different um, conditions, uh, you know, freeze thaw, uh, high pH, low pH, uh, high temperature, low temperature. <clears throat> this is a very stable molecule. And uh, the only thing we were able to make um, uh, actually diminish the confirmation was to put it in peroxide. So 
Uh, just wanted to, and this, by the way, is uh, you can see in the bottom right. We publish this. Inf we have this information out on bio uh, as a as a preprint, and uh, I'm going to show you quite a bit of information that comes from that preprint. So I, I urge you to to take a look at that. Uh, if you go to the next slide now, what I thought I would do is provide a little window into some of the preclinical data, and as I mentioned, uh, much of this is is in a um, is in the, uh, the the paper. And just to describe what's in the paper, it's a structure. Uh, we provide the immunogenicity. We have a very nice uh, rodent challenge model in there, which is, I think, uh, for us has been the most interesting model because they have uh, severe pathology. It was an ACE2 transform mice uh, challenge with live virus done at the University of Maryland. You see weight loss. You see, uh, you know, tremendous lung pathology. Uh, the mice are very sick. The immunized mice are very well. The antibodies and the uh, viral load and the weight loss all correlate very nicely, and you can see protection down to 10 nanograms of our of our vaccine given with Matrix M. So I think together, you know, the vaccine formulation looks very potent. So if you go to the next slide, we took advantage of uh, a track early on in the development program and used baboons. We did this with Ebola. We found that in the context of Ebola. This is a uh, immunogenicity model. They're, you know, they're baboons, so very uh, close to human size, and uh, it allowed us to uh, uh, look at the immunogenicity. And for our Ebola program, it translated very well, and that that included, you know, the adjuvant effect was very clear. The value of the second dose uh, was very clear. Uh, the fact that it was dose sparing, in other words, you know, we could not detect a difference between a low antigen dose and a high antigen dose, and finally. We had a very persistent response out to one year, and actually you can see uh, that in our clinical paper, our Ebola paper. But what I'm showing you here now is our uh, COVID-2373 spike protein vaccine on the left. Uh, this is, uh, you know, probing the uh, uh, anti-spike IgG with the full-length protein uh, by ELISA. Uh, you can see we gave uh, 25 micrograms without matrix or 1, 5, and 25 with matrix. Uh, we gave it at day 0 and 21. You can see after one dose, we have, uh, you know, responses uh, by the second dose. And then as the immune response matures out to day 35, we can see very little difference between the 1, 5, and 25 micrograms of, of antigen given with matrix M. Uh, you can see the role of the adjuvant at 25 is quite low. And then on the right, in the middle panel, we have neutralization performed with wild type virus and a CPE assay, very conservative. Uh, read at 100% CPE, and you can see after one dose we have you know really quite good uh, you know hundreds to thousand uh, you know uh, neutralizing titers. With the second dose, those rise and they mature, and they're you know reaching you know five to ten thousand uh, titers. So these are very robust neutralizing antibodies. You can see on the right, um, you know they correlate, especially you know you can see the correlation. You can see the cluster after the second immunization. So we have a very nice relationship between the, the uh, functional immunity uh, and the, uh, the binding immunity here. So this was extremely helpful. Uh, we're anticipating that our clinical da data should look, should mirror this. Um, and uh, we'll talk about that in just a minute. If you go to the next slide, I'm gonna, gonna provide uh, some new data today. Uh, again, you know, we have looked at different uh, models. Uh, the synomologous macaques was sort of the next in line for us. We're able to immunize them uh, and challenge them, and so I'm going to show you this. They do not seem to get clinically ill. Uh, we find the clinical models for rodents to be more applicable, but this is actually quite interesting data. So what we did here in this trial is we gave uh, two doses. We're showing the one dose data on the left, um, and, but you can see we also did a fractional dose. So we gave uh, five and 25 micrograms of matrix, and then we just used a half a fractional dose uh, to take a look at that. And, you can see on the right, uh, these are neutralizing antibodies. Uh, again, very much, very similar to what we see in baboons, maybe a tad higher. Of course, these are animals that are uh, a little bit younger, uh, maybe more like, uh, you know, adolescents or pediatrics. So quite robust neutralization, again, using the 100% CPE with the live virus at uh, University of Maryland. And in here also, we have, uh, we are identified, uh, thanks to Baylor College of Medicine, a, uh, a set of, of sera from uh, convalescent sera. Uh, they're, they're quite ill patients, and you can see uh, that we get approximately a 900 uh, titer using the convalescent sera. 
And we think actually, as we look around, you know, at, at different convalescent sera sets, this seems to represent what many people are finding using, uh, you know, a wild type CP assay, that these are, you know, the, the convalescent sera is in the upper hundreds. And I think that's probably a realistic. So you can see that we have, you know, a good response. It's supra what you see in convalescent with second dose and approximates with one dose what you see in uh, convalescent sera. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, now we did these, these animals were challenged with wild type virus. Uh, you can see this is a bronchiovelar lavage. On the left, we have just the RNA copies, and on the right, we have subgenomic RNA indicating whether the virus had replicated. And you can see the placebos and the vaccinees. Uh, there's a several log reduction in the presence of virus, and we see very little to no, or mostly no uh, viral replication in the, in the lungs after immunization. Um, this, by the way, was the same group, same model that Dan Baruch, Harvard, used, and so that group we were able to uh, access um, these animals for the study. If you go to the next slide, we also took a look at uh, nasal swabbing, and you can see here on the left, uh, again, the placebos, uh, there's quite a bit of virus in the nose. Uh, there's a, um, many log reduction in the, uh, in the nasal swab copies, and again, uh, we see uh, sterilizing immunity in the nose uh, with this, although uh, the actual, you know, replication of the virus in the nose was relatively low here, as you can see, and that may, you know, that may be further, uh, I think, bolstered by a, a challenge model where we use a little more virus. But very intriguing results, you know, possibly suggesting not only the vaccine uh, could be protective in the lungs, but also at the nose. And I think given the fact that the viral titers, especially the neutralizing antibodies, are so very high, this would not be an unexpected result. Okay, so um, if you go to the next slide, I know time is running on here and I just uh, wanna show a couple more things. Uh, in, in the paper, we have, um, uh, uh, where we, we have quite a bit of detail on the T cell response. I just wanted to show you that we've looked in the upper left-hand panel, these are mice now uh, where we immunize with the vaccine and then we look for, we take out, you know, the, the cells and look for, uh, you know, the, the CD4, CD8 responses. On the left, we did an LE spot. You can see the LA interferon gamma LE spot per 10 to the 6, so quite robust. And then we did similar uh, studies using the intracellular cytokine for, inter, so the middle panel is interferon gamma CD4 cells, TNF alpha CD4, and so on. You can see the adjuvant is enhances the, uh, both the, the quantity and the quality, the, the the uh, multifunctional uh, T cells uh, uh, with multiple, multiple cytokines. And you can see, I didn't have time here, but it's in the paper. We see both CD4 and CD8s. And I think, you know, the, the, the message is the adjuvant plays quite an important role in inducing T cells, CD4 and CD8, and especially improving the, the, the quality in terms of the proportion of polyfunctional uh, T cells based on uh, cytokine staining. And by the way, in our in our uh, phase three and phase two in nanoflu trial, we see very good T cell responses uh, in the presence of the adjuvant. So I think that's one of the features of our vaccine. So, you know, high levels of neutralizing antibodies, very robust CD4 and CD8 T cells, and we'll be looking at that in uh, humans as well. So if you go to the next slide, So uh, let's keep going. Uh, so uh, we have, uh, we're almost done with our phase one trial. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, the trial design included a placebo. Uh, oh, okay, we, we must have skipped a slide. So um, there we go. Thank you. Uh, we did, a, we have completed a phase one trial. We're about to unblind. You can see data end of July, so that's shortly. And we have, it's a placebo controlled trial and, and approximately 131 subjects, uh, 25 uh, received placebo. We have an antigen only arm. <clears throat> and then for the, the kind of the key group C and D, we have a day zero, a day 21 immunization of five and 25 micrograms with adjuvant. So should look familiar to the baboons. And we also have a single dose uh, uh, given. And, and we will, the readout there will be similar to what you just saw We'll have the IgG, <clears throat> the micronutes, and uh, and a subset of the uh, subjects will have T cell uh, uh, data. So if you go to the final slide, um, yeah. So you know we're a, we are a 
go back. Thank you. We're a late stage biotech company. We have very qualified people in the in the company have been through product license. Uh, so we're capable of carrying out a development program. We have a full length. I think what distinguishes our technology, we have a truly a full length common spike protein. It's in a nanoparticle with matrix M. Uh, the preclinical studies show it's very immunogenic. It induces high levels of neutralizing antibodies, CD4 and CD8 cells, and it's protective uh, now in, uh, in uh, more than one animal model. Uh, you know, the, vag the vaccine regimen appears to be dose uh, sparing. Uh, this is a, you know, a, a nice feature because it does enhance the ability to scale up and make uh, many doses. Uh, as you probably know, you may have seen, uh, the investment thesis, I hope, and I've tried to take you through this, but Operation Warp Speed has supporting with us with funding up to 1.6 billion. That's a B. Uh, the Department of Defense uh, also has funded us to 70 million, and CEPI uh, funded us uh, uh, early on, uh, and uh, that's been extremely helpful to uh, the tune of uh, 388 million. And as I mentioned, we expect the uh, phase one data shortly. And uh, I think with that, I'll stop and uh, take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Glenn, for an excellent overview of um, of this uh, technology. Um, I have seen there's a lot of questions that have come by that relates to your manufacturing capacity, but also to your timeline. And I was wondering, in the interest of time, could you perhaps uh, answer the question like, what is your dose selection? How many doses do you expect to be able to produce? And if you start your phase one study um, or your phase three study by mid-October, when do you expect this product to be available for people broadly? Uh, let, let's go backwards. So, you know, the phase three trial will certainly, as as uh, Marian noted, you know, will depend on the data and that'll be depend on the attack rate, et cetera. So we're trying to be very aggressive with that, but um, that's our, our uh, you know, that's the timeline. I, I think you have the right. The, o, the, the Operation Warp Speed contract calls for us to deliver 100 million doses to the U.S. Uh, I think we're, you know, we, we see ourselves as being on track for that. Uh, obviously, that's a a very challenging task, but um, we know, uh, and you you all know this too, that the insect cell technology can be scaled up. Uh, we we can scale this up. We have done this before with uh, other products, uh, so we're quite confident. It is very convenient uh, to have a five microgram dose. We expect that to be our our clinical dose. Uh, we we have a phase two B trial, phase two trial, where we expect to do uh, some dose confirmation. But our data to date, and it reflects what we saw with Ebola, uh, we think that the five microgram dose will be the dose going forward. And the 100 million uh, doses to be delivered for the warp, for the warp project, when do you expect that to be? Uh, out well, that's there? By, that's the the way it's uh, you know put out is by the end of the year, okay. end of this year. And we have you know we do have a global footprint. CEPI has been extremely helpful. You may have seen we bought a facility, we purchased a facility in Prague. Uh, that is being repurposed for, and it's suitable for our technology. So, so we have multiple other sites across the globe where we are scaling up the the manufacture. And as you know, uh, this is insect cell uh, technology. It, it can be tech transferred, and and we're in the process of doing that right. in multiple sites. Well, thank you. I wish you a lot of good luck, and uh, I think it's an excellent program. And we're looking forward to your phase one uh, clinical data. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Manan. All right, so now I would like to introduce Professor George Gao, who is the Director General of the Chinese Center for Disease Control and Prevention. He's a professor in the Institute of Microbiology, of the, uh, member of the Chinese Academy of Science, President of the Chinese Society of Biotechnology, and President of the Asian Federation of Biotechnology. So Dr. Gao is going to talk to us about the development of an inactivated vaccine against uh, COVID. Um, Dr. Gao, the floor is yours. Hi, uh, good evening, good morning, and uh, you know, whatever time you have. Hello, everyone. Um, I was asked by Dr. Shen Lu to talk something about the uh, inactivated, inactivated vaccine, though we also have some um, you know, um, subunit vaccines, but uh, Lu told me I should focus on elected vaccine. So mm -hmm. next slide, please. Yeah, here I want to remind you, so what kind of major forms of the coronavirus vaccine so far, especially under development in China? Next slide, please. 
is a dynamic slide. Yeah, first, United vaccine. So that will be the focus for my talk today. Uh, next slide, please. And then you might have a live attenuated vaccine. At the moment, we don't have any more anything, in my opinion, especially in China, in the clinical trials. Uh, but I know because of the uh, because of the um, reverse genetics, someone must be working on it. And we will soon, in my opinion, we'll have a live attenuated vaccine. Then it's protein subunit vaccines. I think Greg already talked a lot about this before me. So we have something if you want to read, you can read our um, a paper published just in cell recently. And then you have a viral vector vaccines here um, in my group. We also have a chimpanzee adenovirus 7 vaccine under development. And then you have nucleic acid vaccine. We are talking about the DNA, uh, Lucia and did uh, Margaret Leo, they did uh, the DNA prime and uh, maybe recombinant protein uh, boost. So this is something uh, we might want to do in my uh, lab. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, here I want to remind you. So United vaccine, actually, it does work. It did work before. So this I remind you, the first United vaccine for the cholera is in a heat inactivated uh, bacteria. So it does work. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide, give a list of the, you know, all these uh, United vaccines, uh, you know, available or is already done before. I have to remind you, I uh, want to show you, it's not just, um, United vaccine is not just work for coronavirus, not just for COVID-19. It works for so many, so many vaccines, especially in my own field, influenza. At the moment, we are still working on the you know, all the uh, influenza vaccine is an inactivated vaccine. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. I, I want to remind you, so we have so many coronaviruses, especially we have so many viruses uh, in the animal field. And um, you can see the coronavirus, you have four genera. You those four genera, you have a lot of, of uh, uh, viruses in the animal uh, field, and also remind you the COVID-19 is the seventh uh, coronavirus affecting human beings. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, here, I want to show you, um, we already know we have so many um, inactivated vaccine works, and um, you know, at the moment in China, and also, want to remind you, this slide remind you, even when we have a SARS outbreak in China, in 2004, actually to Sinovac, at the moment, Sinovac Biotech, they have their own um, COVID-19 inactivated vaccine. And also, by the time we have SARS, and they developed the SARS coronavirus, but after phase one clinical trials, they dropped. And on the other side, you can say, I want to remind you, in the NIH, they also had developed uh, uh, inactivated vaccines uh, in 2007 for the SARS. So this should remind you, you know, at least we know inactivated vaccines uh, will work for the coronavirus. Next slide, please. Next slide. And uh, next slide, I want to show you, yeah. Uh, we have succeeded in so many animal coronavirus for the inactivated vaccines. The first one is a TGEV. You know, it works in Asia for the inactivated vaccines, especially in China. You know, bi and trivalent for TGEV, uh, rotavirus and a PDV. So those are the diarrhea um, uh, syndrome uh, problem in the animal, you know, in the pigs. So that really works and um, for the inactivated vaccines. And then for the PDV, another coronavirus from the swine, uh, it also, you know, works, um, you know, for uh, Asia as a inactivated vaccines. I know it works in China. Of course, at the moment, they have some uh, escape mutants there. So people is worried about you know how we can 
work for new United vaccine or even, you know, uh, for the subunit vaccine from the protein. So at least I want here, I just want to show you, we have so many United United vaccines. It works in the animal, especially in the swine uh, field. Next slide, please. Now I want to show you four major vaccines under clinical trials at the moment in China. The first one, inactivated. We have four companies in China. They developed for the inactivated vaccine. The first one is Sinovac. The Sinovac is already in phase three. I think they have a uh, contact uh, contract with um, Sao Paulo uh, in Brazil. They plan to have their phase three clinical trials in Brazil. And then you have Beijing Institute of Biological Products. This is one, uh, China CDC is involved because we have them to select for the uh, virus seed. So I will show you later on the data uh, that already published the cell. And then you have a Wuhan Institute of Biological Products uh, with, um, again, those two with the Sinopharm. Mine is also with the uh, Sinopharm. And the last one is the Institute of Medical Biology under the Chinese Academy of Medical Sciences. They are under phase one. So in China, we have four United vaccine in clinical trials. Then you have a nucleic acid um, vaccine at the moment in China, like uh, Moderna and BioNTech. We also have an mRNA vaccine. That's under the People's Liberation Army Academy of uh, Sciences. They, in collaboration with, uh, with Wellvex Biotech, they are under the clinical, uh, phase one clinical trial in China at the moment. Then you have a viral vector, I already mentioned to you. So you have a five based vaccine with this uh, trimeric um, spike protein Greg already mentioned to you. And then you have protein subunit vaccine. Uh, the, 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 the viral vector one is also finished phase two clinical trials. They are doing clinical phase three trial. And protein subunit, this is from my group, you know, in China at the moment, we are in uh, phase two clinical, so we just finished phase one. And, uh, you know, the, the, the design as a dimeric um, subunit vaccine is published in cell. Uh, uh, you are encouraged to read for, from the cell there. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, very quickly go through, you know, those uh, uh, four uh, inactivated vaccines in China. And also want to mention to you, as far as I know, so one more inactivated vaccine under development is in uh, India. So uh, in India, they are also working on for uh, inactivated vaccine uh, there. So you can say, the first one already for phase three, and then you have one, two, or two, one. So somewhere, this is where we are for the United vaccine there. Now, I come to what we have done in collaboration with Biofarm, a Sinopharm uh, with uh, China CDC. Next slide, please. Of course, from the very beginning, when we had all these um, virus isolates, as you know, we shared the sequence. We we isolated the virus early um, January. You know, from then we started to think about how we can develop a vaccine uh, with the inactivated vaccines. So this is uh, give you a very brief introduction how we select uh, uh, virus seed, the seed virus. You can see the one we call HPO2. So uh, on the right side, you can see how good. Uh, the growth of those three, you know, even from the very beginning, we have to select the, uh, the best one for that. Next slide, please. Press one. Uh, you can say, yeah, this is the one HPO2. We select this one uh, compared with the uh, uh, CKO1 and the uh, CODIO1. So this is the best one. So this is the one we use for the inactiv inactivated vaccine. Next slide, please. So then I give you the pr whole procedure. So this is how, you know, we have done what we have done uh, here. Of course, we try to grow the cell. The cell was put into the, uh, we call it cell factory, bioreactor. There it's in the um, uh, BSL3 lab in, Chinese, in China CDC. So 
because there's always a limitation because of uh, BSL3 lab uh, space there. And then we inactivate the virus by the beta uh, propylactona, and uh, and also after that we took the virus superlatent and inactivated, and then of course you have to validate the inactivation. So this is also you know, published in cell. You go and read this paper. Um, the first author, Dr. Wang. And then you concentration of the buffer exchange. And then we go to the next step for the uh, uh, chromatography. Uh, of course, and the aluminum hydroxide as uh, adjuvant. So this is, uh, that's, you know, really is a uh, traditional way or canonical way we prepare for that. So next slide, please. Uh, so for the one, this is uh, one of the four representative elected vaccines in China. So this is, I show you, um, the, the time course when we did the virus titer to compare, you see 94 hours, push cell culture and 144, 192. And in the middle, we, we tested for the different MOI to, mo to get the you know, um, uh, minimal or proper uh, MOI, and then uh, we prepared for three batches. Looks like uh, the inactivated uh, time, like four hours. Four hours is good enough. So this is what we have done with our, we call it BBIBP. So this is the BBIBP vaccine. Next slide, please, I'll show you. So after this, we put the, next slide, yeah. We put also the virus under the um, uh, EM. You see, the, even under the EM, you, it's inactivated but you can still see it's a, a kind of a intact virus there. Um, and then when you run the gel uh, by, um, to, to test the, by the Western blood, obviously you can see the nuclear capsid protein is still there. And in the middle, if you use the S spike a specific antibody, you can see the trimer and also the dimer, by the way, you know, the um, spike protein for the coronavirus, especially for the beta coronavirus, the alpha coronavirus, they form dimer and trimer, UV2. So obviously when you, you know, get this one, even you can get the dimeric S. This is what we have done in our cell paper uh, for the uh, subunit vaccine. So it's designed as a dimeric uh, protein. And then you see the, well, by using the convalescent serum, again, you can detect the S, Trimer, dimer, and also N protein, M protein. So obviously, the inactivated vaccine. You have all those components um, there. So let me show you the next slide so for the immunogenicity. So next slide give you an overview about the immunogenicity. So we try different doses: one dose, two dose, and one or one to two, three doses. Obviously, you can see uh, uh, almost you know uh, no serious, uh, no significant difference. So this is why we decided to use the two doses at the moment for the clinical trials. Um, this is the, what we have done. This slide to show you is all the data from the immunized mice. Next slide, please. And uh, the next slide, we also try to test the immunogenicity with the different kind of animals. You can see, um, see the left slide, rabbit, guinea pig, rats, and mice. So while you show the one dose or three doses, uh, you can see we also put it to the monkey, um, cyanomogus monkey, and the rabbits, guinea pig, rats, and the mice. Again, that shows you, you know, three doses uh, is good enough. Of course, we do, uh, I know what, uh, I didn't have a picture here for the two doses. Two doses also works very well. So next slide, please. And uh, we test the protective uh, efficacy of the um, uh, United vaccine in the monkey. So you can see the left slide, left side in the monkey is the neutralizing antibody titers. And, um, and then uh, we uh, protect, we um, challenge, you, you see the immunization and the whole program on the first line of that uh, with the monkey, with the, uh, um, you know, the needle share to show you how we eject the uh, challenge the virus and we immunize the mice and the monkey. So day zero and day 14, twice, you eject 
and then you day 24, uh, it's a um, challenge. And seven days later, we test for the you know virus. So through swabs, you can see clearly there's some protection. And also anal swabs, uh, again, is good. And in the lung lobes, uh, we you know uh, dissect the uh, monkeys. You can see that it's a, a protection. Next one, histochemistry. Next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, next slide. Uh, you can see from the uh, histochemistry uh, results there. Placebo. If you give uh, enough, you know, good enough doses of the challenge, the virus, you can see typical pneumonia there and the filtration of the uh, lymphocytes and the two microgram or eight micro microgram. This the dose um, for the immunization. You can see. Um, of course, you know, for the two microgram by the middle um, uh, of this uh, figure, uh, the, the bottom line, you can see there's some very mild um, infiltration as well. So, in general, you can see compared with the placebo, it works very well. Next slide, please. And uh, next slide, please. We see the safety. For the safety evaluation, we try to test the uh, for the mice, for the weight uh, change, you, clearly you can see in the red guinea pig, uh, Cyanomongus uh, monkey, you know, um, the placebo, placebo and uh, the uh, three dose of vaccines, there's no difference. So um, the vaccine, inactivated vaccine is very, really safe. And next slide, please. Also shows you the safety evaluation. Uh, of this um, vaccine uh, for the hematological analysis. Uh, again, this is the you, 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 you uh, This data again says you shows you it's uh, you know really um, safe. Next slide, please. And we try to test the cytokines uh, to see whether or not there's any change. Yeah, next slide, please. For the cytokine. Uh, yeah, for the cytokine. No, 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 uh, upper, sorry. For the cytokine, yeah, here I will show you. For the cytokine, you can see, again, it's the same, you know, no uh, influence there. Next slide, please. And uh, this is uh, uh, what I show you, the, the timeline, the milestone we have done. You know, we initiated the, this inactive vaccine, January 25th. If you read through, and now where we are, uh, we signed the agreement with um, um, United uh, uh, United Arab Emirates um, uh, UAE uh, to to do the phase three clinical trials trials uh, there. At the moment. Next slide. I'll give your personal view about understanding questions about the um, vaccine development. First, we really don't know the correlations of utilizing antibodies with the protection. Next, next slide, please. The second question, and can the neutralizing antibodies in the blood reach to your lung? That's again, is an outstanding question there. Next slide, please. Um, how long would the neutralizing antibodies be available, especially in human? Last, we don't know that. Uh, that's an understand, another outstanding question. Next slide, please. So we still don't know whether or not we have the AD effect there. So there's still something everybody is talking about but we have no evidence. Next slide, please. So what is the best immunization programs? And what is, we have so many vaccine under development. What's the pros and cons of all the different kind of vaccines? This is the question I leave. Thank you. Thank you very much for an excellent presentation, Dr. Gao. Uh, there are many questions, as you can imagine, about the safety of inactivated vaccines. And as you uh, allude in your outstanding questions, it's still unknown whether there is antibody dependent enhancement. Could you comment on what you are exactly doing to investigate this further to start? Yeah, this is a very good question. This one, you know, my friend, uh, Dr. Shailu asked me to give a talk about a United vaccine. I think I myself preferred uh, my protein or recovered protein vaccine. So <laughs> we don't know. And in China, at the moment, uh, we are doing something for the recovered uh, patients in Wuhan. 
But I thought, of course, you know, for the re reuvexin. At the moment, we, we haven't seen any ADE yet. So for that question, you have to wait. Um, we are doing some, uh, one of my colleagues, my friend, they, and she did the work in the monkeys for the reuvexin, and she didn't see anything in the monkey. So I hope maybe we do have ADE, but don't forget, for the feline, the effects of the panotitis is so obvious that ADE is a serious problem. So I think we have to leave for that, wait and say what going on later. Thank you. I understand. So you basically indicate also your preference, your personal preference for vaccines being more a protein-based vaccine, if I hear you correctly? Yeah, I think, you know, less component from the, the virus, but, uh, you know, it's a... Uh, a competent uh, uh, vaccination, so that's always the best. But for the inactivated vaccine, we, you know, the components, everything I, I showed you from our Western blood, a protein gel, you know, all the components, and protein, and protein, and the expert, everything is there. So, might be one of them, might be pro provoke the AD. Thank you. Over. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to hand it back over to. Um, to the organizers uh, for the next session.